We have a slight change in program. Um, Professor Jason Roberts hasn't arrived today. Um, so we're moving forward in the program um, and I invite uh, Sarah Brown to come up. Um, Sarah Brown is the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Western Desert Nanapa Walcha Palian It's Western Desert uh, Dialysis. I nearly got there. Um, she's been helping with the Indigenous directors to run the organisation since its inception, which was more than 15 years ago. Um, in 2017, she was Australia's Nurse of the Year. She holds a Master of Nursing, a Graduate Diploma in Aboriginal Education and a Graduate Diploma in Health Service Management. Prior to joining uh, West Western Desert Dialysis, uh, she was a remote area nurse and a university lecturer. She paints, she has exhibitions across Australia and overseas. She has three children and drives a 1959 Morris Minor. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks heaps. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land here. Um, so our official name is Western Desert Ngunnawal Wiltshire and Jaku Chitiku Aboriginal Corporation. We've rebranded this year um, as the Purple House because that's what everyone calls us, but um, for obvious reasons. But um, I tell our nurses they're not allowed to resign until they can say it and spell it, so they all stay forever. <laughs> and um, the topic they gave me was dialysis buses, but um, I can only be responsible for one truck. It's definitely a truck, not a bus. Um, so I'm going to talk about that and about the impact it's got. But first off, you need to know a bit about us. So um, our directors are from the Western Desert. They're Pintabi Luritja people from west of Alice Springs. And they had a problem. And this photo of Mavis Wayne um, kind of signifies what the problem was. Um, they, were a pres they were getting a diagnosis of end-stage renal failure and they were having to leave their country and their family and everything that was important to them to be close to a hospital for dialysis three times a week. So quite a, a brave photo from Mavis saying, I'm a prisoner to my dialysis machine. And actually this photo um, went to the UN to tell the story of people being dislocated from their country. So we're the Purple House. And our story starts out in Kintore, seven hours drive west of Alice Springs. Um, people had got back out to, the, to Kintore and Kirikura over the border um, in 1981 and 1983, having been forced into Papunya. Some of you might have heard of Papunya because it's where people started to paint. Um, so people were really happy to be back on their country in 1983. There was one old fella who actually had ten, ended up having 10 years out in Kintore on dialysis before he passed away in ICU last year. Um, but he claimed to be the first man to have a bath in Kintore because he was there the day they put down a bore and made permanent water. So anyway, people were really happy to be back in country and then started to get a diagnosis of kidney disease. So being quite resourceful, they said, well, why can't we have a machine in Kintore and we can look after people ourselves? At the time, the late 1990s, there was really only dialysis in Alice and Darwin. Um, Tiwi Islands was being built. And so when this mob from the poorest, most remote part of Australia knocked on the door of politicians, the politicians told them to bugger off, basically. So they were not to be downhearted. They got together and they painted some beautiful pictures. And this was the Kintore women, and their painting... Um, sold at the auction I'm going to tell you about at the moment in a minute for $170,000. Um, the Kirikura men, so Kirikura is officially Australia's remotest community. Um, it's a bloody long way on a rotten road. Um, and Kirikura was the place that in 1985 people walked in from the desert naked, having never seen white fellas before. So their painting, so the men's painting, talk about a disparity between men's and women's wages. This sold to Kerry Stokes for $340,000, one painting. Wish I had a few more of those to tell you. 
So they had an auction at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, HG, Roy and HG were the auctioneers, and they raised a million bucks in one night. They formed a kidney committee um, who were family for dialysis patients, and they started to research how to do dialysis and then what it would take to do dialysis out bush. And they helped, asked me to help. So my first jobs were a constitution and a bank account and charity status. Early 2003. Um, and so this mob, m m over the years, we've had really steady governance. Actually, the reality is that a number of people who were family for dialysis patients are now on dialysis themselves. And so um, about half our directors, my bosses, are now dialysis patients. Anyway, it took until September 2004 before we did our first dialysis. And the original model was to have a dialysis machine in the back of the primary health care clinic and start getting people home. Um, um, a few years ago, we celebrated 10 years of dialysis out in Kintore, so in 2000. 2014, so we're up to 14 years now. Um, we moved out of the back of the clinic and to a building next door that had been an old people's home um, that had been abandoned and had a camel living in the kitchen um, and some pretty choice graffiti written on the walls. Um, and we had Rotarians, from, mainly from Canberra, come out over... It was an international rotary project with funding from South Korea, of all places. And we worked out the average age of the participants, the Rotarians who came out and helped us with this building, was 73. And some of them got all the way from Canberra to Kintore and had forgotten to take their medications with them. <laughs> But what it's given us is a big dialysis room, community kitchen meeting area and a three-bedroom nurse's house in the community. Um, it meant that for people like Naparula here, she got to spend the last five years of her life out in Kintore. Um, she was dementing and it got to a stage where she wasn't having much fun. Family, <laughs> family rang and said, she's calling out all night and keeping us awake, you need to bring her back to town. Um, I got a big industrial um, packet of earplugs and sent it to them instead. <laughs> but eventually the decision was made with family and the clinicians that we weren't doing her any favours. And she had a great couple, last couple of weeks out in Kintour on dialysis, with no dialysis. Died with a belly full of lizard, which is a good pin to be way to go. Um, you'll notice the insignia. I once got a um, donation of school uniforms. And the, the polos were fine, but old fellas in the little grey shorts and ladies in the pinafore dresses was a bit hilarious for a bit, but they didn't care. This is her painting in Paris. So this is the Indigenous Art Museum in Paris. Um, so when we were... We just about got through the first million bucks... We still hadn't managed to get any government funding in about 2006. She donated a painting for the opening of this that raised us $118,000. Um, and this was her son. Um, Morris Gibson passed away last year too, but he was, and ICU Alice Springs staff are sure to remember this man. Um, he had no legs. It didn't stop him for a moment he always had a scooter on the go. And in fact, once the nurses um, sent me a photo and they said, we think we need to be saving for another scooter. Um, and he'd had a break in the electrics in the scooter, couldn't find a piece of wire. And so he had wired a mouse in to complete the circuit like this. <laughs> another day he rang me up. I will get to trucks in a minute. This is the back of our purple truck, and that's Morris's painting on the back of the truck. But um, another day he rang me and he said, Hey, Napajari, you've got to send me, I love it, you got to, you've got to send me some more t shirts. And I was like, Morris, you've got heaps of t shirts. And he said, No, no, I had a flat tyre on my little car. It takes five t shirts to fix a tyre. <laughs> And when I kind of squealed, he went, 
relax, it takes four blankets to fix a troopy tire. <laughs> We had, he was incredibly sick. At one stage, he's, he had, um, his abdomen had basically exploded. And the doctors went, he's, we can't take him to the to theatre. This is it. So ICU had all his family from jail marching through in their, their uniforms in there, saying goodbye to him and having a cry. And um, six weeks later, he was back out in Kintore. His HB kept dropping, weren't going to work out how, so every once a month he'd come in on the bush bus for an oil change and, and service, hit a couple of units of blood, and then he'd head back out bush. Eventually he um, got a um, pneumonia, viral pneumonia, and wasn't getting any better. Blood pressure was really low. Um, by the way, I do have permission from his family to tell this story. They, they're very proud of him. Um, and he opted to go back out to Kintore to finish up. He lasted weeks. After many, many years of dialysis, he lasted weeks without dialysis. Part of that was he'd heard that Midnight Oil was coming for a concert and he thought they might like to meet him. <laughs> so he hung out till after the Midnight Oil concert. Um, so we started with a machine in the Purple House in Alice and a machine in Kintore and we started to get people home. And wouldn't you know it, people started to do better. They started to attend dialysis so they could get home. Um, they started to do really well. And we started to get calls from other communities asking for help. So we helped Hermansburg and Yundamu get dialysis. Yundamu with their Kura gold mining royalty money, so money that people could have pissed up the wall that they opted to put into dialysis. And then a few years on, we thought, well, we're not going to have dialysis in every community that people need to be at. And we know that dialysis is three times a week for the rest of your life and we'd love to be in the position where we can get everyone home all the time. But some of the communities that people need to get to have a population of 50 people. There's not, there's, we're doing pretty well. We've got Kirikura these days, which has got an pop, official population of 100, but I think it's like 100 people, uh, 100 people dogs and about 50 people on most days. So we thought, let's have a go at designing a truck and stick some dialysis machines in it, and then at least we can give people something to look forward to. It might only be a few weeks a year, but at least people have got something to hang on to, that they will get to go and see their sacred, sacred sites and visit their grandkids. And so I tried to get National Geographic to fund it from their DNA testing kit fund. Um, failed, too quirky for them. Um, so we eventually got this funded by Medicines Australia, so peak body for pharmaceutical companies. When drug companies do something naughty, like, you know, trade stores are pretty boring these days. You can't even get a free bloody pen, can you? Um, they have to put money in a swear jar. So this is $300,000 out of their swear jar. I've always been one for swearing. Um, and they helped us to build this. I now know more about truck engineering than I ever thought I'd need to know. It's been on the road for seven years now. Um, and it's never had a cent of government funding. So community chucks in. Um, it's, 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 it's really useful to us in a number of ways. Aren't, one is it's a bit beautiful. The paintings were dialysis patients. So that was that old lady whose paintings in Paris. Paintings that were in a show in New York in 2009. When this comes into town, you notice it. Um, there it is heading into Docker River. Um, so uh, lots of people who aren't particularly interested in dialysis get interested in big purple trucks. And in fact, when this arrives in town, the kids run at it. I think they think they're going to get an ice cream. <laughs> uh, this is um, Jungarai, Patrick Jungarai from Kirikura, dialysing in Kirikura, Australia's remotest community, with his favourite grandson in his lap. And this is his painting on the truck. 
Um, when we have the truck coming to town, it's a great opportunity to demystify dialysis. Um, Well-engaged dialysis patients talking to people about how to keep their kidneys healthy. And traditionally, the kidney holds the spirit. Kurumpa is spirit, and it's held in the kidney. So there's some quite sophisticated stories that um, involve um, the spiritual world and the lifestyle modification world together. But much better to have well-engaged dialysis patients telling that story than the only story you know about dialysis being that people get really sick, hide out from the clinic, head to town and never get home again. At the moment, we're dialysing Jack Thompson and others um, in the truck in Kakadu. And Australian Story was filming with Jack yesterday. So look out for that story about Jack and the purple truck coming up soon. So the truck's had a busy time in the top end in the last little while. We got it to Gama to, and um, dialysed up there. And so that's a big festival every year in Arnhem Land. Dialysed eight people, including Jack, on the truck at Gama. And then it went to um, Kalkarinji for the Wave Hill Festival. Um, so, you know, that picture of Gough Whitlam pouring the sand in the hand of um, Vincent... Uh, thank you, Lingiari. I was going to say Namajira then. Um, and then it went to Borolula and now it's up in Kakadu. So great opportunity to help people to get home to the things they need to be at. Um, we do... Um, significant work around funerals and festivals and also in WA where we now have three dialysis units um, you have to be licensed as a C grade day hospital and that's the same standards as for a for a for profit Fresenius unit in the suburbs of Perth it's, it's horrendous um, but they haven't caught up with truck licensing yet. So we can, while we're setting up the dialysis unit little room in the clinic, we can be, and we're not allowed to dialyse in that, we can have the nurses dialysing from the truck in the yard. Um, shh. <laughs> um, so this is our, and this is actually out of date, this is our geographical spread at the moment. Um, we're from Warburton in WA and we've got a part-time nurse in Perth. We've got a drop-in centre in Darwin at Rapid Creek um, and we're in Yakala, Groot and Elko. So we've got a couple of islands. So this is Pintaby Mob from the desert helping people out across remote Australia. And um, likelihood is that things are going to get busier because we've had some really good news this year. And one, So on the 1st of November, there's a new Medicare item number for a dialysis done in a very remote location by a nurse or a health worker. So if you think what that means, every dialysis that we do more than 100 k's from Alice Springs um, will attract $592 worth of um, Medicare money, including on the truck for the first time, we'll have some money, government money for the truck. So it means also that we're getting lots of interest from across remote Australia um, asking how to do this. And so we're actually planning to get everyone together in Alice in April next year to sit down so our directors can tell the story of how they do it and how um, they fit together white fella medicine and Aboriginal, Aboriginal um, cultural priorities together. So in Alice, we've got the Purple House, which is the only dialysis centre that I know of that's got a pizza oven, a fire pit, it's got chickens. We had a baby yesterday. If you want to see the baby, there's a little video um, on the Purple House Facebook page. I need more likes. Um, <laughs> We had a chicken naming competition yesterday, um, last year when we were desperate for some money and so the chook who's been sitting on this fertilised egg, her name is Dame Egna Doris Hermione Napajari <laughs> and now she's got a baby to look after. 
Um, it's a complete madhouse. The patients run it. We have a GP, we have GP clinic. We have OT, physio. We do lots of cooking. I'm chief chin plucker and toenail cutter. Don't tell the podiatrist. Um, with my Telstra wire clippers in between podiatry visits, I'm very careful. Um, and we have a bush medicine making business, um, which is income for people. Um, and we have old American tourists. If you're interested in the story, I was on Richard Feidler's Conversations last week week and you can listen to the podcast and about my husband's out bush vasectomy in Om Pelly many years ago, which is a t completely different story. Why would you be interested in this? Paul Lawton's doing some research on models of care at the moment. It's not been published yet, but it shows that people who get home to country on dialysis have less than half the hospitalisations of people who don't. Um, and so there's really big incentive for keeping people well and keeping them home on country. There are also really good evidence that people are living a lot longer and Central Australia has gone from the worst survival rates on dialysis in the country to the best, which is pretty bloody fantastic. Um, so lots of great stuff happening in the desert um, and lots of fun to be had and... You haven't dung dinged me. It's not like me to go under time. One of the things we do at the Purple House is um, we have old American tourists come to visit. And they come, um, the patients love having them to visit, not just because they pay $10 a head to come and hear the story of the Purple House. But um, I have to tell you my kangaroo tail story. In Alice Springs, in the freezers, you can buy frozen kangaroo tails. When I was a remote nurse, I did see a couple of people who'd been bonked over their head with a frozen kangaroo tail in the middle of the night. But um, So one of the favourite things to do is people will sit and they'll cook tails in the fire and they'll tell stories and sing songs, make a damper. And while you're doing that, they can be going in to see the doctor and doing their washing and, you know, we're a one-stop shop. Um, but so the tourists will come and people are sitting around and the patients will invite them over to come and see what they're doing. So the tourists will come over. It's overseas adventure travel, but they are all old American tourists. <laughs> and um, they're all in pastel polo shirts with big cameras and their socks pulled up. And um, this one day, um, Jeddah called people over and, and this woman said, how long do they take to grow back? <laughs> <laughs> now, the first time I got this question, I said, no, I'm really sorry, they don't grow back. And she said, well, don't they all fall over? <laughs> and I said, no, people eat the whole kangaroo. This is just like the party food. And they all started to squeal with horror. So now I just say two to three weeks. <laughs> I worked out we'd had a 1,000 old American tourists through the Purple House in a year. That's $10,000. And um, now about half of them think that tails, kangaroo tails grow back like lizards. <laughs> But a couple of, on, on the kind of how can you work in the same place for 15 and a half years, I'm a little teapot, um, no two days are the same. And um, a few weeks ago, Bobby West, who's our chairperson, who's from Curicora, is now on dialysis, um, he rang up and he said, I'm going to cook you all lunch. And I thought, it's been 15 years, Bobby's never offered to cook us anything. You know, blokes aren't known for their cooking. So I said, thanks, Bobby, that'd be lovely. And he giggled, which was a sign. He said, I'm going to send in someone, a fella, to show you what I'm going to cook you. And this bloke arrived with this enormous frozen feral cat. It still had, like, you know, it, was, it looked like it was just asleep, <laughs> but it was frozen. You could have banged it on the table. So we kind of patted it and said thanks and hoped that it got a better offer overnight. But it came back the next morning and it had been cooked in the fire. It still had its skin on. Bobby put it on the bench and carved it up. And um, laughing, he was making us all pussycat sandwiches for lunch. <laughs> But that particular day, 
uh, we had a busload of school kids from Bellingen, and I thought they'll all be they'll all be vegetarian hippies. No, nah, they all they they and their teachers all tried a bit of pussycat, <laughs> and um, and then we had an, a busload of old ladies from Sydney who were on a line dancing tour of Central Australia who'd come to line dance for us. Not so many of them tried the cat. I think some of them had too many cats at home. But I can tell you, um, better when it's warm and a bit like lamb, but I think I've done it now. I don't usually eat meat, but (laughs) <laughs> when your boss cooks your lunch, you've got to give it a go. Um, I do go home to, to the cat that my kids brought home on the school bus 12 years ago, and when he's been an arsehole, I just say, I know what she tastes like. <laughs> um, I think I should stop there. Yeah. <laughs> I did leave some postcards. and uh, So the, the other good thing about dialysis trucks is memorabilia. So I've left some, um, some postcards and some key rings out there. Um, please feel free to take some. And if you know any dialysis nurses who want to come and have an adventure, then we'd particularly like to hear from them. Thank you. <laughs> Is there any questions if you're brave enough to ask for Sarah? <laughs> they all want to go for lunch, I think. Okay. Yeah. I can hear. Thank you for that. That was just incredible. Um, I guess I want to know what can we do to help, I guess, as members of the public or intensive care nurses. Is there anything that we can do to support you? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, like the Facebook page for a start and follow stories there. I mean, I'm, I'm getting my head around the fact that with this Medicare item number for the first time in 15 years, I'm not worrying about funding next week. Um, but we um, we just love having friends, and if you if you're coming through Alice or you've got family, they're very welcome to come in and say hello at the Purple House in Alice. It's just in the suburbs, um, and yeah, we just goodness me, not knowing how you can help. Um, we love students. We love volunteers. Um, we love people connecting with us when they see an interesting story or something comes across their desk that they think we might be interested in. So I don't have to <coughs> spruik so much anymore. But it's a real... I mean, our di- for our directors, it's incredibly important to them that they... There's not a lot of good news <coughs> stories in Aboriginal health and they're incredibly proud of what they've achieved. And part of that is busting some stereotypes about Aboriginal people and Aboriginal communities. And so they just are really keen to engage with people. And if you get an opportunity to say to people, hey, have you heard the story about the Purple House? Then, then that's enough. You can keep your money in your pockets at the moment. <laughs> Though I do in my bag, I have a, we made a Purple House swear jar. <laughs> I'm the one that keeps filling it up. But um, I did bring two with me, so if anybody wants to take a Purple House swear jar, it's just a cardboard fold-up, then um, you can grab these, or if you send me an email, I'll post you some. Great. Any other questions? You can also you can also go to our website and we um, we've got an online shop for the bush medicine and people ask us do the bush medicines work we stick to externals because we don't know how anything interacts and my answer is people were hunters and gatherers they wouldn't go and pick and grind things up and use animal fat to make rubs if it didn't bloody work so. Um, we've got this great one, Irimanka, which um, I love to take pots up to the hospital and watch people smear it all over themselves and all over the 
white sheets um, and turn everything green, um, which people use for muscle aches, restless legs, headaches. And then another one, Arata, which is fabulous for dry skin, itchy skin, psoriasis, eczema. Um, so if you're interested in that, we're Oxfam traders. We've got an online shop and we do have a number of stockists around the country. It's good fun. Thanks. Great. Please join me in thanking Sarah. And we've got an early minute for lunch.